uh, my talk is on the Christian story on idealism. And um, to start out with that, though, we have to kind of identify what the Christian story is. Uh, how do I? Oh, here we go. Um, yeah. Yeah. So the basic elements of the Christian story. Um, this only covers the basic elements, uh, the, the ABCs, which you basically need to be saved. Admit you're a sinner, believe Jesus died for your sins, and confess Jesus as Lord. And then there are, of course, other elements like a, a pre-fallen state and a second coming. But those aren't addressed here. We're just kind of addressing the, the core of what you need to believe, basically. So what are the elements of the Christian story, the basic elements of it? So first we have the fall. And with this, uh, the elements here are there's an outer evil. It's the existence of evil in the world, pain and suffering. And so on. And then there's inner evil, which is original sin or the fallen human nature. And of course, this is caused by the knowledge of good and evil. So, uh, then of course, how do you get out of that? That's the second half of the Christian story. Um, there's salvation. It's uh, through Jesus' sacrificial atonement. And it's by grace, not by works, and it's the gift of God. So, how do we derive all of this? I made a video called Why There is Evil back in 2012, and I basically argued that you can derive all these elements from two basic things, idealism and privatio boni. Now, of course, this was... I made this some years back, and this was kind of a, a first attempt, and I was a bit of an apologetics hack, but I've since realized that to make the model fully work, it needs to be modified a little bit. I'm going to kind of explain why here. So, in particular, there are two problems that need fixing for the model to work for the video, and the video to work. Uh, firstly, this is regarding kind of vanilla idealist philosophy, just basic idealism, and a lot of times people don't realize it kind of involves panentheism, but there are different types of panentheism, weak and strong panentheism. I didn't understand the difference between the two. I just assumed it was one lump thing, and I didn't even didn't know because of it that there were actually problems, theological problems with the latter one. I just kind of naively put it together and didn't realize. And then, of course, regarding privatio boni, you need a, a form of privatio boni that actually produces positive evils and not a strict absence of evils. Or uh, evil is an absence because that kind of makes evil appear as something that isn't really existent. And obviously, real evils exist. And, whoop, an example of that would be, you know, cold is an absence of heat, but if you're out in the winter in Wisconsin, where I come from, and you're, you know, don't have a, a jacket on or a coat on, you'll freeze to death. So, uh, firstly, a recap on weak versus strong panentheism. Firstly, there's pantheism versus panentheism. Pantheism is God is the universe. Panentheism is the universe is in God, but God transcends the universe. Now, there's strong panentheism, and that is we are part of God, or God's I am, and this is found in Eastern philosophies like, or religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, and then of course there's things like Christian science too. And then this is contrasted with weak panentheism, which is more orthodox, and this one is, we are in God, we are not, we are not God. This would be, the Eastern Orthodox Church actually holds to this, and this is also theistic idealism. This is uh, Bishop Berkeley, uh, Jonathan Edwards, a lot of people don't know that, he was like the great reformer, and he developed, uh, held of that too. And then, like, more recently, there's apologists like Keith Ward from the UK that hold of that. And then, uh, with weak panentheism, they have an energy's essence distinction that distinguishes God's mind from the, the thoughts in God's mind, which are God's creation. So now, I, when I first realized this was a problem, I found this, you know, it came to the issue of explaining the existence of evil on idealism. I had been able to distinguish the model from pantheism by positing God existing beyond the universe. So that it was okay, but then I ran into this other problem of, well, and this additional problem came in when I defined God as the all in the second chapter of the video, and then the all as the good in chapter three. So it's God's above the universe, but there is a silly issue of identifying God with the all, which is a bit problematic when you look at it closely. So now it would be true that God would have to contain everything to be the greatest conceivable being, right? You know, if God, if there's something beyond God in the sense that diminishes God, and that God creates everything as good. However, the trouble is that if God is everything and God only does good, then it would seem that evil choices are impossible. You can't, you know, God can't make any evil within himself. And so therefore evil can't exist. Now I had come to a sort of solution later in the video in chapter 6 where I said that uh, evil is explained by a conscious state in God's mind deciding to know the knowledge of good and evil. And the idea here was that the conscious state was a subsidiary conscious state and not actually God's mind himself. But, you know, I, I can't quite distinguish between the two. So, hadn't clarified what was meant by that at the time. Um, 
The problem was in having additional minds in the model that could, uh, you had to have you know, additional minds that could choose evil, basically having conscious states in God's mind that are different agents than God. And if one were to take a naive vanilla idealism, you would have just God's mind, in a sense, this would appear to be true, but it's not exactly true. Now, in chapter four, I kind of waffled on this because you know, my, my thinking on this was progressing a bit. I didn't have it fully hammered out, but I was, hadn't fully distinguished the two types of, two types of panentheism yet. Uh, for instance, in chapter four, I mentioned that from God's perspective, there would be just one mind from, of God's. The context was in this was of showing that our pain is also God's pain, and thus God's concept of good is recognizable to us as well. So, you know, it's not just God being some capricious ubermensch tyrannizing us. It's God feels our pain and doesn't like it any more than we do. Uh, now, however, this would be because of our conscious states being nested within God's mind. So it's God contains our minds and therefore our experiences, but God is above our minds as well. So keep that in mind when you watch the video. Um, now, and if our conscious states are nested in God's mind, then there is a sense that we are thinking that God's mind, thinking with God's mind, right? I mean, there's God's thoughts in God's mind. That's part of what God is thinking with, and so our minds are thinking with that too. And then I, I mentioned that in chapter four. Now, the conundrum with that is, on the one side, one could have you know conscious states nested in God's mind, and then on the other side, these conscious states have to be independent minds that can choose evil on their own. So it seems to be a, a paradox at first, right? You can have you know, there's God's mind, which is thinking everything, and yet within that there are separate minds from God that are able to choose evil. So, a, um, first, um, recap on the energy's essence distinction, just kind of show what we're trying to derive here to create that distinction. To resolve this, we need to derive the energy's essence distinction from idealism, and God's energies would be equal to God's thoughts or God's creation. God's essence is God, or God's I am. And then God's I am is a sink from God's thoughts. So how do we derive this? So now what's fascinating is, believe it or not, I found that the way to derive this was actually to do it from regular theism, from just you know traditional theism itself. And so well, it turns out if God is omniscient, you know this is you know that's just a standard definition of what God has to be. That's one of the the prime properties God has to have to be God. And so therefore, if God is omniscient, God has a perfect simulation of the world in his mind. Every, everything that he knows, all down to the, you know, the exact number of hairs in your head and the exact number of quantum states in them, he has to know those in precise detail. And then if he knows all, has all the information contained in his head and knows at each succession point in time, succession point in time, that would mean that there is a simulation actually running, that, that set of information is equal to a simulation of the world running inside of God's mind right now. This would include our conscious states, because you know God even knows our innermost thoughts. And so, and the issue here then is that God would be simulating minds that would think that they are actually real minds inside of God's mind. They think that they're living in the real world, even though they're in this simulation created from God's omniscience. And so, obviously, they can't be God because there'd be at least a 50-50% chance that we would be one of them and not realize it if they're an exact simulation of us. So. They are made of, God, made of God's thoughts, but they can't be God. So, um, kind of sum this up. An example of this would be Huck Finn in you know, Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens creates Huck Finn as a character, but obviously Huck Finn is not the same being as Charles Dickens. So, Huck Finn and Charles Dickens have two distinct identities. And then this would also explain how evil characters can exist, even if the author himself is an evil. An example would be you know, Sauron from Lord of the Rings, and Sauron is a pretty terrible character, but Tolkien, who created Sauron is, and you know, is containing Sauron in his mind, is not a bad guy. So this leads to the adjustment, the first adjustment we have to make. So the solution is, it's not just everything is in God's mind. Uh, there are, everything is in God's mind, but there's more than that. It's autonomous, smaller minds can exist within God's mind that can also connect or disconnect from God freely, so they can choose to align their wills with God or misalign their wills with God. And then this, in turn, is important for the adjustment needed regarding privatio boni. So, second one, uh, evil is an absence, but it's not just any kind of absence. Particularly for the model to work, it requires a certain kind of privatio boni. It would be a privation of ordering instead of substance. Since God cannot cause a privation and people can't make stuff to just disappear out of 
like magic or anything. Privations have to originate from free agents willing to disorder an already good state of affairs. Like if you took a, a glass, it's a good glass, and you drop it on the floor, it shatters, and you have these broken shards, and well, those are bad, people cut their feet in them, and so, but obviously they were part of a good thing to begin with, even though they're now bad. And so now we come to the, the video. Keep in mind, uh, when I made this, it was, I didn't quite figure out the difference between strong and weak panentheism, so there are some issues with it, but the, the basic frame of it, I think, is valid. He said he was about to change everything, science, medicine, religion. Chapter 1, Prologue. It has often been asked, if God exists, then why is there so much evil in the world? Surely if God is both omnipotent and omnibenevolent, he would put an end to evil at once. Yet evil exists. This conundrum is what is often called the problem of evil. The problem of evil presupposes the existence of a deity. Thus, to begin our examination, let us assume that God exists. Before we continue, however, it may be useful to make certain deductions from the existence of God. Chapter 2. God, the Universe, and Everything It is said that God is the greatest conceivable being. If God does in fact exist, then curiously enough, this statement gives us predictions as to the nature of reality as well. To demonstrate what I mean, let us compare the concept of God with the concept of the All. If God is not the All, then there is a being that is greater than God, namely the system of God plus that part of the All which is not God. But then God would not be the greatest possible being, and therefore not God after all. Thus if God really does exist, we must conclude that God is the same as the All. However, God is also said to be a mind. Therefore, if God is a mind, and God is the All, then the statement, the All is a mind, logically follows. Thus we see that the concept of God entails a curious consequence. If God exists, monistic idealism follows. But since the universe is within the All, you may ask, isn't the universe made of matter? This is actually not true. There's another theorem, which is called Koch and Specker theorem. It's much less known. Uh, and that theory tells us that the culprit is actually our notion of reality. We know that it is wrong to assume that the features of a system which we observe in the measurement exist prior to the measurement. But couldn't one say that this involvement of the observer is really just limited to very small quantum mechanical systems? Uh, those people say that, and this is a, a, a comforting uh, uh, pos, pos Possibility, but there's no reason to believe that. Nothing in the theory, the theory tells us that. Findings in modern physics tell us that both matter and space-time are fundamentally illusory, and that both are emergent from patterns of information that underlie them. To get for a, quant to a quantum theory of gravity is that space-time is not fundamental. Um, that space-time is, if you like, an effective emergent description from something else that underlies it. Um, so, and that something else could be information in the following way. The conclusions of these findings have been summarized by computer scientist Brian Whitworth and popularized by NASA physicist Thomas Campbell. They show us that all the weirdnesses of modern physics suddenly make sense if we view the laws of physics as derived from the laws of information processing in a virtual reality. With this in mind, the concept of the universe being a conscious state in God's mind, as admittedly bizarre as it may sound, is actually quite plausible. Why? The conscious state, when viewed from the inside, is a virtual reality. The very same thing our best physics tells us about the universe we inhabit. Underneath the molecules and atoms and particles, there's another layer of reality that's coming to light. It's a layer that's based on information. With this understanding of God, we have come to interesting conclusions about the nature of reality itself. But what, you may ask, does all of this have to do with the existence of evil? Chapter 3. Privatio Boni If God is the greatest conceivable being, then God would have to be identical to the Platonist conception of God as the good. Anything less than the good would have to be less than the greatest conceivable good, and thus not the greatest conceivable being. This appears to accentuate the problem of evil, though. We have already determined that God is the All. However, if God is the Good, then it follows that the All is also the Good. Yet evil exists and appears to be a part of the All. 
The only resolution to this paradox is that evil exists in the same way that shade or coldness exists, as an absence of good and not as a thing in itself. This is summed up in the Neoplatonist doctrine of privatio boni. Namely, evil is defined as the privation of good. Things would then be good insofar as they exist, and evil insofar as they are incomplete. Malice, for example, could be defined as a lack of goodwill, disease a lack of health, and war a lack of peace. Nach den Gesetzen der Physik ist das, was wir als kalt empfinden, nur das Fehlen von Wärme. Und existiert Dunkelheit, Herr Professor? Selbstverständlich existiert sie. Nein, sie ist nur das Fehlen von Licht. Wir können das Licht messen, aber die Dunkelheit nicht. Das Böse existiert nicht, genau wie die Kälte und die Dunkelheit. Gott hat das Böse nicht geschaffen. Es ist das Ergebnis dessen, was Gottes Hand noch nicht berührt hat. Chapter 4. A Short Detour. Euthyphro's Dilemma. Though not related to the problem of evil itself, it is worthwhile to examine the Euthyphro Dilemma in light of what we have thus determined. The Euthyphro Dilemma sets up a dichotomy between the following options. 1. The good is greater than God, therefore God is not the greatest possible being. 2. God is greater than the good, therefore the good is determined by God from outside of the good, making God akin to an ubermensch in the philosophy of Friedrich Nietzsche. But in Chapter 3, we determined an immediate solution to this problem. There is a third option. God is the good. But how do we know that the good is good for us? Might it be that the definition of the good is capricious to human standards of goodness? The panentheistic definition of God as the all resolves this problem as well. If God is the all and God is a mind, then the all is a mind as determined in chapter 2. However, this leads to another peculiar conclusion, namely that from God's perspective there is only one mind, God's. All their minds, even if they are unaware of it, are subsidiaries of God's mind. So, Neoplatonism was this search for truthful thinking, thinking with the mind of God. While man seems to have a mind and seems to have a knowing power, he is actually knowing with the mind of God, whether he knows it or not. Thus the concept of God as a divine ubermensch becomes incoherent. God being the all would have no reason to harm any other mind any more than he would have a reason to harm his own body, and for exactly the same reason. Thus the conflict between selfishness and altruism would be superseded altogether. Having resolved the Euthyphor Dilemma, let us return to our examination of the existence of evil. Chapter 5. Knowledge versus Sensation in Monistic Idealism In Chapter 2 we discovered that if God exists, that monistic idealism would also have to be true. Now, if monistic idealism were true, then the world would behave as a virtual environment. Coincidentally, exactly as we have discovered it behaves in modern physics. However, how would we determine what sensations instantiate within this virtual environment? Being in God's mind, anything within a virtual environment would be perceived as a conscious state, or knowledge, from above that virtual reality. Thus, knowledge of something would be perceived as a sensation of that same thing from within the virtual environment. What are the people? Projections of my subconscious. Yours? Yes. Remember, you are the dreamer. You build this world. I am the subject. My mind populates. For example, the knowledge of green, as perceived as a platonic entity from above, would instantiate from within the virtual environment as the empirical sensation of greenness on such things as trees, grass, and apples. Chapter 6. The Existence of Evil. Now, if mental knowledge of something is externally perceived as that thing from within the virtual environment, then how would evil exist within the virtual environment? Logically, it would mean that the conscious state comprising the virtual reality would know the knowledge of evil. However, there is a catch. As we learned in Chapter 3, evil is the absence of good and cannot exist on its own. Thus, for evil to exist, good must exist as well. Thus, for evil to exist within the virtual environment, the conscious state containing that virtual reality would have to know good as well. In other words, it would have to know the knowledge of good and evil. So what would it be like to know this knowledge of good and evil?
Now you know. If God does in fact exist, then the answer is that evil exists not because God will not stop it, but rather because he wanted to know the knowledge of good and evil. Chapter 7. The Resolution of Evil Thus far we have determined that if God exists, that the evil in the world can be explained by a conscious state in God's mind deciding to know the knowledge of good and evil. Let us refer to this part of God's mind as primal man. Individual minds would then exist as proverbial subdirectories of primal man. And that our consciousness may be related to that initial conscious moment. All of these minds would then know, and thereby also be corrupted by, the knowledge of good and evil. A part of Voldemort's soul latched itself onto the only living thing it could find. Harry himself, a part of Voldemort, lives inside him. The minds of the people we are trying to save, but until we do, these people are still a part of that system. However, evil, being an absence of good, could not be fixed from within the corrupted construct. It would be the same as trying to fix a car with only half of its parts. Regardless of the excellence of the work of the mechanics, the car could never be fixed. Imagine prisoners that have spent their entire lives chained deep inside a cave. They have been chained so that they cannot see behind themselves they are forced to stare endlessly at the cave wall in front of them. Behind them a fire is burning, and between the prisoners and the fire is a raised walkway. Now imagine that each day a menagerie of objects crosses the walkway. Animals and people carrying their wares to market. Their shapes create an intricate shadow play on the wall in front of the prisoners. This is the only world that the prisoners have ever known. situation to be rectified is if someone from outside of Primal Man showed up inside the corrupted construct yet was not corrupted by it. I killed you, Mr. Anderson. I watched you die. And then something happened. Let us refer to this hypothetical figure as Second Man. He's different. Your father was the creator. Yeah. He's the one. Then by integrating into Second Man, individuals from Primal Man would lose the corruption of Primal Man and would be saved from the construct corrupted with the knowledge of good and evil. Thus we have discovered that if God hypothetically exists, then the world would logically have to be a virtual construct. <clears throat> the, the more interesting aspect to that question is, who's the programmer and where's the computer? <clears throat> That's the Catholic and, Church, and, for God's uh, sake. And if God exists, then this would logically be the explanation of the existence of evil. And if second men were ever to hypothetically show up in it, then he would be the resolution of evil. Professor, what is that? Something beyond either of I have. A 
part of Voldemort sent here to die. No! You can't take away my power! And lastly, it would be most curious if anything in this hypothetical scenario bore a resemblance to those things that exist in the real world. In your world, I have another name. You must learn to know me by it. So, uh, here we have, uh, can get the whole Christian story out of idealism and privatio boni. Uh, the big problem now is privatio boni is kind of counterintuitive. It's like evil is an absence of good, but obviously things like Ebola virus, cancer, and war aren't just absences, they actually exist as things, positive existence. So, the two questions we have is, number one, how do we get positive evils from privatio boni? And number two, how do we derive privatio boni in general? Like, I, I just kind of asserted it as a hypothesis there, but I didn't actually derive it straight up. So now, uh, later came to a solution to this, and you need basically three things to derive privatio boni. Number one, idealism. Uh, this you can get from the mind being immaterial, from the hard problem of consciousness. And then there is substance dualism is false from the interaction problem. Material things and immaterial things can't interact unless they have a shared property, but then one would be material or immaterial, and not really separate things. And then secondly, uh, just the val category of value exists. So there are things that we label good and bad, and we have concepts of what good and bad are. And from those three things, you can get privatio boni. So now time for the second video. This is kind of a short addendum to the other video I made later, kind of adding to it. And here's how I derived privatio boni. The view that evil is an absence of good is known as the doctrine of privatio boni, meaning the privation of goodness in Latin. It was first derived by the Neoplatonist philosopher Plotinus, but was later brought into Christian thought in the works of St. Augustine. In my video Why There is Evil, I even argued that one could derive specific theological doctrines such as the Fall, and its relationship to the knowledge of good and evil, from privatio boni and idealism. However, privatio boni is not always intuitive. For example, though one could argue that they are distortions in good things, war, disease, and cancer all seem to be actual existence. However, there may be a way to derive privatio boni in a robust way from first principles from an idealist paradigm. To set up the foundation for this, let me quickly rederive idealism from the introspective argument. As I have pointed out in previous videos, the hard problem of consciousness entails that the mind is a non-emergent, immaterial substance, and the interaction problem rules out substance dualism. As such, monistic idealism entails, a result which nicely fits with the discoveries in modern physics demonstrating quantum non-realism, and the fact that physical space-time is an emergent illusion. Moving on from this point, we find that our minds have senses of value that allow us to label things as good or bad. However, whose sense of value is right? After all, relativists will point out that we have differing opinions on what is good, and if morality is subjective, then how is any one person's value set more universal than any other person's value set? The flaw here is the inability to recognize a larger mind. Once one understands idealism, one recognizes that our minds, and thus our concepts of value, are contained within a larger mind. Since our minds are the product of that larger mind, and our minds contain value, it follows that our senses of value derive from God as well, and thus it follows that God also has a sense of value. But some might say that God's sense of value is subjective like everyone else's. In truth, it is subjective, but it is not like everyone else's. Given that in idealism, God's mind contains all of existence, no sense of value can exist that is not derived from God's sense of value. This fact allows us to draw a curious conclusion about God's sense of value. Though this sense of value is metaphysically subjective, it must also be universally intersubjective. Since all senses of good derive from God's sense of good, it follows that God's sense of good is universal. And what is universally intersubjective is epistemically objective. Thus God is objectively good out of logical necessity. However, acts of creation are the products of intentionality, and one's intentionalities are motivated by one's values. Thus it follows that creation is good as well. But then if God sees that all is objectively good, whence cometh evil? The only remaining solution is that evil is the privation of good. 
hence the doctrine of privatio boni. But what do we make of value sets that conflict with God's value set? How would it be possible for such a value set to exist? Wouldn't such a system of values conflict with its own existence? To explain this, we would need to identify how such value sets come into existence. If we start at the beginning, we have only one mind with one value set, namely God's. Since this value set is the only one in existence, it is defined as universally good. This good value set then causes a good intentionality, which then causes a good creation. And since this creation is good, according to Privatio Boni, there can be nothing missing in it. But then how is privation produced? On the grand scale, it would be impossible since by definition nothing in the all can ever be missing from the all. Therefore evil could only ever exist at a limited scale. Namely, an individual creation would be deprived of some other individual creation needed to make it good. But since this other thing would still exist as part of the all, this privation would necessarily have to exist in the form of a separation or break in the intended design. A privation in ordering rather than a privation of substance. Privation would then more precisely be defined as a distortion or disordering in the good. Thus, given that a value set in contradiction with God's value set would necessarily need to be an example of such deprivation or disordering, the mind that produced it would likewise need to be disordered. But given that the missing elements needed to make this mind ordered also exist, it would follow that this mind is in a state of disconnection from the rest of God's mind that contains those elements. Thus, the explanation for value sets other than God's value set is not that God's value set is relative to, but rather that the subsidiary minds are in a state of ego or separation from God. This concept of ego or ego consciousness as privatio boni when applied to other minds will be relevant in future videos. Okay, so the conclusion is uh, disordered things become evil things. Uh, so there's, you know, like the, the glass example I gave, the glass falls on the floor, the shattered parts of the glass are bad even though what it came from was good. There's got to be some way to fix this. Okay, that works. Uh, now, now, you, now you've got... Oh, now it's... Oh. <laughs> that doesn't work. Don't swap. That's odd. Okay, so... Um, deriving the Christian story. So you have the fallen state, which is ego or separation from God. Um... This one is in that verse in John 15 where it says, uh, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away. And Oops. That happens. Had that happen the other day in the theater. So, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away and cast, and, and cast them into the, and they're cast into the fire and they're burned. It's John 15, 6. Um, the unfall, so the unfallen state is then uh, in Christ or in connection to God. Um, the verse for that is, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's John 15, 5. And then that's... What? Uh, yeah. And the fallen state, of course, is where you're fractured off from God. And so now, how does one get back to God? Now, there are, within religions around the world, there are three basic models of spiritual formation or connecting to God. The first one is we call it kind of the religious doctrine, uh, religious view. This is from my kind of spiritual formation class at Biola. Um, basically, there's some kind of divine law, a set of instructions, and uh, this is found in some Judaism, much of Islam, and even in Christianity during the Middle Ages. Um, this is kind of based on legalism, which is focused on external works. Like you have this law, and how do you measure up to obeying this law? So you're basically trying to keep a set of rules. Of course, this is all done from within a state of ego or self. And, you know, even if you're able to keep all laws, you're maybe not happy doing it, or you're not actually you find yourself unable to do it eventually because it's you're simply not connected to God. Second one is the Eastern model. This is uh, uh, done in two stages. Firstly, there's works to prepare this. So the works aren't the point of this. They, they do works, but that's to try and get the soul in the right place so that it, it can align with God, and then there's an upward flight, upwards flight of the soul to God. So then you're based, that's, the, that's the really important stage. The, the works are just to prepare you for connecting to God. And this is found in Hinduism, Buddhism, and of course New Age practices here. Now this is not salvation by works 
in the classical sense, works are only to prepare for the soul for the second stage, as I just pointed. And the, the focus is on spiritual development rather than external actions. However, the problem is, is the second stage is still done out of a self-effort or ego. And so it's, you're still in, you're trying to connect back to God from a state of being disconnected to God and well, being disconnected from God, you're damaged, and so you can't properly do that. It doesn't work. And this is contrasted with the Christian model of spiritual formation. This is kind of unique to Christianity, and it focuses on inner transformation rather than external works. However, unlike the Eastern model, God initiates a transformation rather than the ego. God changes you. That's uh, the whole, we can't change ourselves thing. It's Jesus saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. It was in 15, John 15, 5 before. And then so, um, so I'm deriving the Christian story. I, so um, look at the fallen state. We have an identity separate from God. That's ego. That's after the fall. God doesn't have ego, but he does have an identity in separation from us, simply because, you know, he's on the other end of the shattered pieces there. Uh, what causes or defines the separation is sin. We choose privation, mostly avoiding. We choose to disconnect from God and enter into that shattered state. Right here. So now, but how does God reach us? God has to do it, obviously, because we can't do it on our own, but God has to reach us somehow. So now, God has to die to his own identity in separation from us, even though he has no privations of his own. He doesn't have ego, but he dies to self anyway, in a sense, to get to bridge past those disconnects. And so this is in Romans 6.10. Uh, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. For the life he lives, he lives to God. And he, of course, is Jesus. And then all that's left for us then is to die to our own egos. Uh, so even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And that's Romans 6, 11. Then the connection to God is restored after that. And so you have the, the two pieces die to themselves and merge, and that's actually where we get the, the marriage symbolism element from Ephesians. Um, the two become one. It's Ephesians 5, 31 to 32. So it's two die and they they stop becoming two and they become one again. And now there's connection back to God. And so good works follow as a result of the change character, but are not the point. You know, once you're connected to God, you're going to do the good that God wants. But the whole point of Christianity is to allow God to get close to us. And then that's the get past the unfallen state. And then the good works follow after that. But the good works are not the point of what you're doing. Now, the question, of course, is does it work? Uh, you hear stories of this all the time from, you know, Jesus saved me from X. Like maybe there's a, a famous football player or something, and he's being interviewed, and he's kind of on, banana, uh, on fire for Jesus, and he's saying, you know, I was into alcoholism or sex or drugs or whatever, and God pulled me out and praise the Lord and all this. And, of course, well, the atheist looks at this, and he's, he thinks it's kind of silly. He said, but this is all just in your head. This is just kind of fundamentalist exuberance, and he's kind of, He's feeling good about this, and so that's because he's feeling good about this, he's able to, you know, make it work somehow. And he's really just using religion as kind of a, a placebo, and it, it's, there's really nothing to it other than it's all in his head. Well, it turns out, actually, that psychologists have shown that, yes, it does. The famous analytic psychologist Carl Jung noticed that alcoholics who could not get free by any other means, could sometimes have marked improvement by sudden personal religious experiences. And Jung was actually a colleague of Freud, that they kind of had a fallout, and then Jung went off on his own way doing his own thing. But uh, Jung's insight from this helped form the basis for the Alcoholics Anonymous program. And this is actually an example of how this, the Christian spiritual formation model works, even though they may not explicitly say it's Christian, but it's the same mode of how God gets to you. So now, when you're in, you've seen these, you know, movies or times in like TV shows or whatever of someone in Al Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, and everyone's sitting around in a circle, and what do, what do they often say when someone's asked to, inter you know, people are asked to introduce themselves in Alcoholics Anonymous circle? What, what circle? What do they? Anyone knows what they say? Yeah, I kind of gave it away. Hi, I'm Bob, and I'm an alcoholic. Right? It's kind of a a cliche almost. 
basically what Bob is doing there is admitting his sin or his failure, namely he's an alcoholic. And secondly, Bob admits he can't defeat alcoholism by himself. That's the first step. And then it turns out AA also has, uh, says you have to believe in a higher power that can fix you for it to work. And that, that's why that's very important, Alcoholics Anonymous, for them to, for the people that go there to believe there is a God or a higher power. And then Bob turns himself over to God to deal with his alcoholism. And then from there, Bob cleans up his life and moves on. So, then still though, the question raises, and the atheist comes back, or the skeptic comes back and says, isn't this just a placebo? You know, maybe he's, that, that works only because it's only in his head though. And this, but the problem is this charge presupposes that only materialistic accounts of explanation are valid. See, the atheist or the skeptic will think that, you know, it's just a brain state there and he's, he's tricking his brain into having this experience such that his experience can then help him overcome his alcoholism, and so he's basically outwitting his alcoholism. However, that kind of presupposes that matter causes mind states rather than vice versa. On an idealist account, or even on a dualist account for that matter, the mind can causally affect the physical world. So it's not a matter of you know, him just tricking his own brain, is that his mind is actually affecting his brain, and, or you know, some mental agency is affecting his brain and causing the change. And so something being, therefore, something being all in your mind, quote unquote, may not make it necessarily fake. That's the whole, the whole, isn't this just a placebo thing kind of begs the question as to whether, you know, mental agency is really not fundamental in the first place. So how might this work on an idealist model? Well, let's model God's connecting to us under the idealism model. And of course, one doesn't need to understand this to have a personal relationship with God and it's kind of feels a little weird to kind of model this like that but just kind of for the I made this for the atheists and skeptics benefit so they, they can see that it makes sense to them otherwise they're just you know they'll just throw it out out the window to begin with so a fallen state a conscious state is one in privation of course and a privation of what though well consciousness is treated as integrated information so it would be a privation of information information from you know God's personal relationship. It's kind of a weird way to describe it in such a clinical term, but this is for the atheist benefit, remember. Of course, on both dualism and idealism, consciousness is fundamental rather than emergent, though idealism allows you to model it uh, with physics, right? Because it's all ultimately one reality at bottom, and the, what we call the natural is really kind of an emergent effect from the supernatural. And idealist modeling using quantum cognition, that's where they treat thoughts as wave functions, uh, would help explain this. Uh, wave functions, these are probably some people don't know what that is in the audience. It's uh, in quantum mechanics, they, they have this wave function where they have a, a particle in a superposition of possible states before you look at it, and then it suddenly um, takes on a, a single state when you look at it. And what they discovered elsewhere is that these same wave functions, the mathematics that describes them, also describes the behavior of thoughts. And they call this quantum cognition. They actually had this published in. I think Scientific American a couple years back, and they're actually modeling, they found that thoughts model exactly identically to wave functions, quantum wave functions. And uh, wave functions have, uh, when you put more energy into them, they have higher information, and then of course the energy content corresponds to a higher frequency, and so that also corresponds to more information content. So therefore, kind of the formula here is wave functions with higher information content have higher frequency of vibration, and lower content have lower frequency. So there's actual physical difference that you can measure with this. Thus, being connected to God would have a real effect distinguishable from a fallen state. It's not just, you know, something that's, you know, atheists like to say that things that are religious don't have any bearing on the real world or are not measurable, and, well, that's false. In turn, this can actually cause behavioral changes and even physical changes in the person when this happens. Um, this was uh, from Scientific American from last year. Uh, it's called Changing Our DNA Through Mind Control. And as I said, the quote here, a study finds meditating cancer patients are able to affect the makeup of their own DNA. And, with, and also this kind of extending from this conclusion, one's mind can actually alter one's genetics and epigenetics. So it's epigenetic changes I think are easier to change mentally, but 
And of course, this is just their minds doing it for meditating, but you know, that's doing it for when their own self. But imagine now, if that's just our finite minds, God has this infinite mind. Imagine what God can do if God has well, you know, much more power than we and God's not fallen. God can change a lot of things. And so if the sun makes you free, you will be free indeed. So that's the, God actually does set people free from sin and so on. And that's the presentation. Well, th thank you very much for a good presentation. You brought a lot of material together in a short time. Uh, I wondered, um, uh, you have either good or evil, and it seems like there are gradations in between. And so one definition of good, or, or evil, is any distortion of good. And um, it, it seems like there are things that are also bad but are not evil. So there's another, another distinction, like the black hole. Um, it's, a, it's a phenomenon of nature, but if you were to be sent to it, that would be bad. But if you were sent there on purpose to destroy you, that would be evil. So I think there are some gradations in here that help fill out the picture. I was wondering if you had any comments on that. Hmm. Well, I mean, I suppose if you, a black hole by itself is not a bad thing. If you were sent there, I, that would probably be a, maybe you were suicidal or maybe someone sent you there out of murderous intent. That there would be evil there, but it would be the evil in either your mind or the person's mind who was sending you there. And so there would be a, something broken there. Well, for example, another example, uh, if you had a perfect religion, but um, you, that was enforceable by uh, death, the death penalty, <clears throat> so everything else about is good, but it has that one little tenet, then it kind of just it makes everything evil or bad. <clears throat> so it seems like there's some gradations where uh, so something can be not um, according to ideal, but not for evil reasons. And then, in that case, it would be evil because it destroys someone's freedom of choice. I think that would be, it's a, like a level of evil, but it, it's, I mean, just because it's a gradation of evil doesn't make it a, not a privation either. It's not, it's good, but it's not the best, basically. There's something, it's still a broken reflection of what the ideal would be, basically. It would be made ideal because God would be perfectly good, make perfectly good things, but then what happens afterward is, it's okay, it's better, but it's not the best thing. Thank you. Uh, I got a question on one of your first points. Uh, you compared Huck Finn to uh, Charles Dickens. No, 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 no. Uh, Huck Finn was the character, Charles Dickens was the mind holding the character. And the point was there. Uh, you got that wrong. It's Mark Twain. Oh, oh, Mark Twain, Mike. Mark Twain. Sorry, well, isn't, oh, what was I thinking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> isn't it? That's a disordered information. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't know what I was thinking. I probably put that together late at night and it was like, <sighs> yeah, 2 o'clock in the morning does that. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking there. I have to, I have to fix that. Have kind of a little embarrassing mistake, but it happens. It seems like as far as what's evil, I mean, uh, inanimate objects, I don't think, can be evil in amongst themselves. It has to be a, a thinking person, essentially, um, or being of some sort that uh, knows right from wrong to some degree. And well, I think that's kind of put in every living thing to some degree. Yeah, so you're saying like natural evils, like landslides and so on, that might crush someone. That no, that's not really evil. That's bad, no. but it's not evil. It, it it's can natural be evil. In have a bad sense. effects, but right. I evil think that evil. was the kind of the point with the whole with the virtual reality model there, where it's inside of a mind, and the, and the entire the entire consciousness system that's generating the virtual environment that we call the physical world is corrupted with it in some basic sense. It's not a human evil, and that we would think of in a a direct sense as being evil, but it's still a negation of good that exists somewhere in the, the corrupted program, well, essentially. To so say a landslide is evil is not considering the, uh, the viewpoint of the, uh, of, uh, of the one making that choice or the decision. I mean, to, to us, uh, 
flies and rats probably think we're evil, you know, because we kill them, you know. Well, uh, supposedly, you know, we're before, ruthless to that. Right, I know, but like in an ideal but, world, all the creation would be in harmony, and you know, maybe they would have some other function other than causing us trouble and wanting exactly. us to put them in. Rat they have a so place. On. Yeah, they have uh, a place. The place is now disordered, and so now they become pests to us. In, and in fact, if you if you want to use that logic, uh, probably the most evil thing on the planet is oh, human beings, because we're we're doing the most to destroy right. the earth. Then, uh, we're the best at that. No, well, it's all disordered, so the humans are <laughs> making a mess of things and the it's, animals, I suppose. It's their right. internal disorder caused from right, basically right. leaving God. Yep. Um, I, th I think there may be an important uh, distinction that's sometimes made between natural evil and uh, um, personal evil. Um, and, and this bad would be like a landslide that crushes somebody. Um, uh, personal evil would be like somebody that uh, shoved a bulldozer and 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 brought uh, a wall down on top of somebody. The person gets crushed in both senses. Um, personal evil is pretty easily explained by personal choice. Natural evil is not as easy. But one of the things to keep in mind is that if you have a perfect creation, there would not be natural evil. And number two is that it can be blamed on either the fall or the flood for most of natural evil. If you have a flood, then uh, af uh, during the flood you have tectonic plate movements, which will eventually give you volcanoes, tsunamis, um, various other things like that. And if the climate before the flood was uniform, you would not have floods, you would not have droughts. Um, hurricanes. Uh, some of the, you know, if, uh, if beforehand we were shielded either uh, before or after the fact from uh, damaging rays, we would not have, to have most of our cancers either. And we would not have um, uh, you know, whatever, uh, whatever would heal as the tree of life, the leaves are for the healing of the nations, would be able to heal any incipient damage that might happen before it became what we would normally consider evil. And so perhaps looking at that, at that framework, the creation does turn out to be really important in this scenario because you have to have an original good from which we fall uh, in order for it to fit well into an idealistic model. Right. And Pro I think it's probably. important for us not to give up, especially on things like the flood, because I think they do account for much of what we call natural evil. Right. You wouldn't even have pressure differentials and no hurricanes then. Yeah, so you wouldn't have evil. hurricanes, you wouldn't have tornadoes, all of that stuff. Well, perhaps, or perhaps uh, sin came into this world at the time that the the knowledge of, the, uh, of uh, good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, was was eaten by Adam and Eve, and then maybe more of these things occurred. Um, but it's just I I, I think it like f an example of fire. Fire is very good. In fact, all civilization, if without fire, we wouldn't really have much. Uh, but then you know you can get burned too. Like that guy got burned alive. Well, that's evil. But it's not the fire that was evil. It was the person that locked him in this cage and started the fire. That was very evil. But they're just using tools that are here in this, you know. And the point is that you do evil and it goes off into nature and can come back later. Well, that's the effect of sin. I think, yeah. you know, it, it's, it has a, a cycling effect and we've all been affected by sin. We're born into this world and then we're born into sin of the world. Yep. Uh, it's very interesting to see this uh, construct, but it still leaves me with the question, how on earth did evil originate? I mean, is it a cancer within God? Well. That's the whole thing that it was, it was 
I mean, you know, God has knowledge of evil in his mind, and so he's, in a sense, right. it's a simulation of evil going on, even though but, God but, himself is not evil. Like, like for example, the, the Sauron and Tolkien example. There is Lord of the Rings, Sauron is a bad character, Tolkien is not a bad person, yet Sauron is in this mythical universe that Tolkien has created in his mind. Yeah, and I'm not too familiar with that, but the point it seems to be that God uh, within himself has created the ability of components or parts or elements to do their own thinking, to do their own creativity. And he's not forcing himself for them to remain good. Right, and that would actually be good on his part because otherwise he'd be forcing free will and without free will right. he can have real love and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be good then. But, but it still creates the, the mystery, the, the, the impossible question to answer. How did Lucifer, uh, once he, I mean, he realized his freedom. How did he How did he go out and do that which was destructive or that antagonistic? That is an interesting question. I think I'm not certain. I think I was talking with Paul that, about that the other night, and it was kind of, or someone else. It was kind of a mystery. I'm, I'm kind of. <laughs> that is a good question. Maybe, it, maybe, maybe the solution of the answer to the problem of evil is that Satan doesn't actually have a good reason. It'll, it'll be kind of, basically saying that, you know, at yeah. the end of it all. But, but it is the gracefulness of God to give Lucifer the freedom right. to do that, even though he knew that it was right. like a cancer, and, he, and you know, we would now limited thinking would say to say, use the uh, surgeon's scalpel and cut it out. Right. But God chose not to cut it out. Um, and there comes this question in, in saying, okay, do we, by observing the results of evil, desire not to go that route? I mean... I think, uh, given a second chance, uh, it would be like saying, <laughs> forget that, we're not doing, not doing that ever again. They burned the knowledge, tree of knowledge of good and evil down or something. Uh, Lucifer made his choice. Right. And it was through pride. I right. I will ascend upon the mountain. You want to be become like the God high. or higher than God. He's the one that said, I right. made that choice. Right. We made that choice. Sin is the definition of separation from God. Right. We made that choice when we chose to eat it, when Eve or when we chose to take from the tree to know good and evil. We chose that state. And we remain in that state until God rips out our old heart, which we cannot cure. It's incurable. And gives us a new one. We, but we still have to come to him and beg his forgiveness. Right. That was the whole part where we had to die to self to integrate back into God. So God you know, I would say. raise one other, one other question, and that is that uh, um, if those want to deliberately choose to put self in, in the place of God, it is entirely possible that God's morality doesn't fit with them. That's true. I mean, when you see that all the time, where it's, I mean, it's ultimately inconsistent with the logical system that it exists in, and so they're because of that, it's going to eventually decay and it's going to end up with a bad situation. But, but yeah, I mean, you see that all the time with atheists saying that, you know, God's moral system is bad and so on. Well, to me, you could, so from the spirit of prophecy, there are some statements that you could create a scenario, not one that gives a good reason, but at least a mechanism. So this, it, it sounds like the, the um, planning for the creation of this earth uh, was done among the Trinity, and Satan and Lucifer was excluded from that because he had nothing to add. You know, it'd be like to me Niels Bohr and Einstein sitting around discussing the, the nuclear aspects, and a layperson, we'd have nothing to add. We'd get frustrated. It would be angering to us. Why don't you say it simpler so I can understand it? And so Lucifer would have just been frustrated. So he was not invited um, as a you know something that uh, was to protect him from uh, was to protect him so he took that as a slight well what you know to me I'm like Jesus I don't see anything that different between me and Jesus I'm I'm a light bearer uh, they always consult me for everything to communicate to the rest of the angels and so he got his feelings hurt now if he had just said 
and he was doing this all internally, so um, he was brooding about this. And if he he could have just said, "God, I don't understand these feelings. I'm tempted to doubt you. I'm tempted to question your goodness here," he could have just, as a learner, um, process that and come out and, he, and say, "Oh, okay, I understand. I get it now." But he didn't. So he let it build, and this was. You know, God had to give this time if he mm -hmm. came in too soon and acted too quickly. So he had to give it time. Lucifer then confided these doubts to other angels, and, and they thought, yeah, he's got a good point. Uh, so some angels felt he had a good point. Some felt he didn't. And so this foment uh, took a while for it to come out. Um, so to me, there's a mechanism. You know, he, Lucifer got jealous because he didn't see that much difference. Between, he forgot that he was a created being and didn't see that much difference between him and Jesus. It's like if my brother, um, if, I don't get jealous of the president, but if my brother became president, I might be tempted to say, well, wait a minute, he's, there's not that much difference, so why don't I get that, that privilege? So I think there's, so it doesn't excuse it, it doesn't uh, give it a good reason, but it still gives a mechanism because to me there was, some reasoning that was going on that right. uh, led to this whole thing. So that's kind of, to me, how you could sort of create a, make sense to me, you guys can interact with it, so. Yep. I think it's plausible. Uh, a couple of things. Number one, um, the Bible says, I think in the Old Testament, affliction shall not rise up the second time. The Lord is going to make it sure absolutely sure that we don't pull this trick one this more time. Happen again. Yes, that it does not happen again. Do you, do you see any, or what's the difference between spiritual formation and this emerging church thing that we um, talk about? I don't know how it's connected to the emerging church. I was just bringing it up because it was, and by all, uh, all the Talbot students are required to take these spiritual formation classes. And that was what they taught us in the first semester, or one of the things they taught. They didn't say anything about emerging church or anything, and it was, it was pretty biblical from what I saw, so I don't know of any connection between those two. So on this issue also of sin not arising again, to me, um, so to God's creative. I imagine he's going to, whether he has a hiatus in his creation now or not, doesn't matter, but he's, I imagine he will continue to create. There will be new beings now in the universe, <clears throat> who will have to go through their own learning curve on this issue of whether God can be trusted and, and so forth. So I, I can imagine that, um, and that's t uh, where maybe um, the song of our experience, it's like a team that we hear that somebody in planet Zergon is struggling with this issue, and so we go and, you know, uh, uh, earthlings mm -hmm. go and talk to him and convince him. But there might be some that, now, I still, just like Lucifer, he didn't have a good reason to reject the truth, but he still did, and it was a pride thing. Mm -hmm. said, yeah, I believe the truth, but I don't care. So it could be conceivably to me that somebody in the future, it could be that the experience is enough to really convince people. So is, I'm sort of on that side. But it could also be because of freedom of choice that they say, I don't care. And then they will cease to exist. That's what would have happened to Lucifer at the beginning, we're told by... Uh, spirit of prophecy, he would have ceased to exist, but because people didn't understand why he died, they would have assumed God had killed him. So when it was really just pulling the plug. Uh, so to, in the future, to me, somebody can cease to exist. Nobody will question it. We will understand it. We'll celebrate, on the one hand, the fr that freedom of choice still exists. But we'll lament it. We'll be sad. Um, and then it won't spread. So to me, in that sense, it'll not sin won't arise in the sense that it will spread and threaten the well-being of, of the whole being. Because right. now we have the exper experience, we know. It's not going to happen, it's not going to spread. That was that person's choice. Or it could be, I don't know, whether our experience will be enough convincing that nobody would ever, everybody will eventually, you're right, um, uh, I have no reason to doubt, and uh, everything's wonderful from there. So that, right. to me, is answers uh, it, is a scenario that could explain why it won't arise, how, quotes, it, it won't arise. arise. You know, you showed uh, a picture twice, split second. Uh, I 
child about to fall dead and the vulture sitting at the back ready to eat it, that man who took the picture shot himself. Oh, yeah, wow. he, he could not handle this anymore. Evilness of evil, when, it's, when people realize it, you know, they don't want to. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. We're going to be convinced beyond ourselves that we do not want to go well, through it'll this anymore. It would be like putting your hand on a hot burner a second time. <laughs> Yeah. We've been immunized. Yeah. yeah. Worse than a hot burner. Well, thank you very much and uh, appreciate your uh, presentation. And uh, uh, who knows, maybe we'll be able to see you again sometime. Yeah. Um, for those of you who are going to be here in uh, next week, again, uh, Dr. Brand will be talking about epigenetics, genetics, and evolution. And uh, the two weeks from now, I'll be talking about uh, Eugene Kunin and the origin of life. So.